Oops, that's the wrong one. When experts debate climate policy in the media, it can get quite confusing at times. Can you please tell us a bit more about what policy options we have? You have my sympathy. Um, it does sound really complicated, even when I listen to the media. And that can be frustrating for me because I'm always trying to get the message across that decarbonization requires either carbon pricing or regulations. And that's it. So carbon pricing is like a carbon tax where you put an extra charge when you're buying gasoline uh, because the gasoline, of course, when you burn it, is the cause of uh, CO2, uh, which causes climate change. Or you put in a regulation that prevents you eventually from buying a gasoline car or using gasoline in a vehicle. And um, But I want to say that uh, when I talk about carbon pricing or regulations, I say and or, like you can do one um, or the other. The point is you don't need to do carbon pricing if you don't want to. Then why do we often hear that carbon pricing is essential? Well, I think that's probably mostly the fault of my profession. I'm, a, I'm an energy environment economist and um, my colleagues and maybe me in the past too have sometimes talked about how carbon pricing is, is a good way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And so sometimes people can slip up and say it's essential, but that's actually not true. Um, and so maybe it's something to do with our cost obsession that leads us to say that. We're very interested in reducing emissions as cheaply as possible. And um, the carbon price, because it is the most effective, it means society has more money for healthcare and equity and, uh, and education and so on if you reduce emissions as cheaply as possible. So you say we must have carbon pricing and or regulations, but what about other policies like um, subsidies to buy an electric car or labels on fridges? Yes, so um, there's a lot of those kinds of policies. And um, two decades ago, three decades ago, when governments were first starting to act on climate, they gravitated to those kinds of policies because well, they're easier politically. Obviously, if I'm taking tax money from somewhere and I'm giving you a subsidy um, when you uh, put more insulation in the walls of your home, or I can put a label that informs you that this fridge is more efficient than that, they're fairly benign policies from a political sense, but they actually don't reduce emissions very much. Um, you still might have them, uh, but that's gonna be, you know, you might use them as a sweetener when you're putting in carbon pricing or regulations because these policies really affect people's costs and they're more difficult, but it's a little easier if you can say, oh, and we're going to give you a subsidy when you buy that electric car or when you insulate your home. If carbon pricing and regulations are both legitimate policies, is there one that is better or um, should we have a combination of the two? Yeah, so it's not, we don't need to have both. So just as I said, I mean, the key operative term here is and or. So you could do it all with carbon pricing, you could do it all with uh, regulations, or you can do some combination. And, um, and I think that's good because it liberates us a bit. Uh, as we look around the, the, the climate sincere jurisdictions in the world, the leading jurisdictions in decarbonization, they tend to have had long histories of different governments bringing in different policies, and so they've overlaid regulations and carbon pricing and quite frankly i'm fine with that um, you know so there is no best policy but we know we need to have pricing and or regulations and that's the simple message that everyone needs to have thank you welcome